Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part two of my quest to find the anomalies in the Kerbal system. With the ISA maps at, we have been scanning Duna for various anomalies and we have found three of them. The first of which is this face that looks like a Kerbal, except that he isn't screaming. So whatever space travel this race possessed, it did not involve rockets and explosions. Now, obviously, this is a tribute to the infamous face on Mars which was photographed by the, the Viking 1 probe back in the 70s, and uh, it persisted in popular culture, even after the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Orbiter uh, took a proper picture of it and revealed it to be just any old hill that was just had opportunistic shading. Nonetheless, it's a nice place to visit. It's on the equator, uh, sits inside a crater, and is relatively easy to get to. Um, yeah, you saw that I've got the landing autopilot with the coordinates set in. Um, MechJeb has been absolutely terrible during this video. None of the times I asked it to land did it land anywhere near anything that I wanted. So in, instead I had to manually fly things in. But yeah, there you go. The face on, uh, the face on Duna. Perhaps some uh, indication that there is intelligent life other than the planet Kerbin. Who knows? The second anomaly is the buried rover. Now this is uh, slightly about 30 degrees south of the equator and it's actually really hard to see. I had to get right on top of this before I found this stock sticking out of the ground. Now this isn't R2-D2. Um, no, this is a, a model of the camera. It looks like the camera module on the Curiosity rover. And I guess this is what some people said would happen when they read about the Sky Crane maneuver. They didn't think it was going to be successful. Um, so the third anomaly is the mysterious pyramid, which is pretty far south, near the South Pole. Now, uh, this is a white pyramid-shaped um, structure. Now, if you remember the face on Mars, it was in a plain place called Cydonia, and Cydonia also contained pyramid structures. This one um, looks pyramidal, but start, makes some sort of weird warbling chirping sound. So uh, if we uh, get down on the top of the, the pyramid, we can cut the motor so we can actually hear what the audio is. It sounds to me like um, some sort of computer signal, and it turns out if you do some reading, you find out that there's something called slow scan television, which is a technology developed by ham radio enthusiasts to send images over shortwave radio. Yeah, so SSTV has a storied history. It was developed around 50 years ago and originally used like a Vidicon tube and a display that had a long, long persistence phosphor to display images. And, and they were like 120 line images, very low resolution for the time. But the technology, of course, didn't stand still. And uh, in the early days of the space race, it was actually really important. It was used... Um, by some of the first space launches. For example, the first images of the far side of the moon were taken by uh, using this system. They were broadcast back to the Earth. And because it was a standard, um, anyone on the Earth could decode these things. Uh, the Apollo missions actually used this for their internal, for their photography. Um, yeah, on many other systems, Vostok, um, the first pictures of Leica were sent as well using SSTV. And uh, more recently, uh, in popular culture, the if you remember the Portal action, uh, actual reality game where you had to find radios and put them in the right place and they would make these strange noises. Well, and they ultimately it revealed the, the clues to uh, Portal 2. Well, um, those well, that we also used SSTV. So... Instead of uh, fancy high-resolution tubes and all that, I can just download a piece of software and plug the output of my sound card into my uh, input. And this is what we get when we decode it in software. You see this weird un inverted four, some planet-type things as a pyramid with a line and four figures on top of it. It's an interesting image, uh, even when it does get synchronized properly. Who knows what it is? It's probably just an Easter egg, but one can speculate. And so on to the moon. Now, the moon, most of these anomalies have been around since the previous versions. Um, we're going to start with the monolith. There's one on the edge of a crater near the South Pole. Um, takes Well, actually, it's deep inside a crater, actually, at the South Pole. It's kind of hard to find uh, unless you know the exact coordinates. 
you, it's really, once you get to the South Pole, you look for this really, really deep crater, and there it is, right at the very bottom. It's got the squad logo on it, just like all the others, of course. Um, the second monolith is near the equator, so I've called it the equatorial monolith. It is also sitting in a crater. It is south of the large crater, which has um, a couple of other anomalies in it, so it's actually easy to visit if you visit these other ones. Um, one's an arch. Well, okay, we'll talk about that. The The northern monolith is the one northernmost, of course, and it, it sits uh, more or less on the edge of a crater this time, or on in the, in, in the edge of a large crater, and yeah, it's about 57 degrees north, so it's not really near the pole. But just like the other ones, it sits there and, and you know, watches the planet Kerbin below. All of the monoliths, of course, uh, have a view of Kerbin in the sky. Now, the, one of the new ones that was added is the Armstrong Memorial. Now, uh, this, I'm sure you can guess what it, who it's a memorial for. Uh, the coordinates of this are almost the same as the landing coordinates of the Apollo 11 lander. And uh, you can see there's a kind of Kerbal style version sitting on top of this monument. You you know, you don't need to worry about l bumping into it. You will actually just fly through it. But uh, I tried to move around it. Unfortunately, uh, in the morning, the sun does not shine on the plaque, so you can't read it. Also, there is a strange flag next to this one that seems to have red stars, uh, red stripes and blue stars on it. Uh, white stars and a bl It's red, white, and blue with stars and stripes. God. This is going to look bad in my uh, citizenship exam someday. So yeah, um, <laughs> just try to land this thing and then we'll, uh, we'll time accelerate. So yeah, Neil Armstrong, of course, very important person in the um, history of space exploration. Of course, he uh, famously felt he was just doing his job. He didn't think uh, he was particularly special. He just thought he was the best man for the job and did his best to be humble. I remember reading a story about a journalist who had secured an interview with Neil Armstrong. It wasn't related to the moon landings. It was something else. Uh, Neil had agreed to do this interview, and it was uh, something like September 14th. 2001 when he had scheduled the interview of course September 11th 2001 grounded every plane in the country and the journalist you know, phoned up Neil Armstrong and said you know of course you're not going to do this interview anymore we'll, we'll reschedule and he was like no 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 we'll just just drive over here of course the journalist had to drive hundreds of miles to uh, interview him but you know Neil had made that appointment and he felt that he needed to to stick to it you know, so we should all be aspire to be like that, you know, to be reliable and do our duty. Anyway, the last things to find in the moon, of course, are the arches. Many of those are really huge and visible from orbit. Um, so they should be easy to land at, right? So uh, I trusted Mech Jeb to do this one. And yeah, he, he messed it up completely. Um, this one is, the, I call it the central arch because it's kind of near the middle of the map. It's on the, the lip of the crater that also has the Armstrong Memorial, and it has a, a monolith to the south. There is a second... Um, there is a second one, which I call the Eastern Arch, because it's on the east, and it sits on the north side of a crater. This is also another one that's easy to fly past. Here's me uh, not quite orbiting past it, but moving past it at pretty near orbital velocity. And finally, we have the Hidden Arch, and not many people have seen this one. It shows up on MapSat, and by uh, coming down, I I, I, found, I plugged in the coordinates as exactly as possible, and you know couldn't find any object. Maneuvered around, uh, tried to get myself as close to the exact location as possible. You see me just crawling across the surface at a few meters per second, and uh, I decide that I'm close enough. I've got my coordinates to within three decimal places of where I need to be. And so uh, I land here, and there, I, there is nothing on the map. What is going on? Well, I mean, I think I've suggested by saying that it's the hidden arch. Well, anyway, this is uh, what happens is I, I look around. No, not there. Nothing there. You know, if you're looking for these um, things, it's also a good idea to 
turn off ground scatter, unlike me. And then, yeah, as I kept panning around to say, wait a second, I can look under the ground. Is it under the ground? Yes, it's under the ground. There is a giant arch under the ground. I fully expect to receive comments and messages challenging me to fly under that. Anyway, I hope you found that useful, interesting, or even entertaining. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.